Asa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Namo Tassa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambuddhasa Bodhang Damang Sankang Namasami. I love starting that way, but it all makes it sound so formal. <laughs> and I want you to know that while you have us here, um, you probably don't get to see bhikkhunis every week. So feel free to ask us anything you'd like to ask. Um, and uh, we both are happy to answer questions. I'll start with saying a little bit more about us and our place, I think, just so you have some more context. Um, one, of the, one of the stories that Venerable Nisabo said that he appreciated was uh, a story that we actually shared earlier with a smaller group. Some of you are still here, so you already know this, but when we started Karuna Buddhist Vihara, um, we tried to really um, meet whatever needs it seemed were uh, showing up in the community and trying to teach a smattering of different things, you know, beginning meditation, of course, and, um, you know, things that they might feel attracted to. But in the end, um, we just shifted to teaching what we love to teach, which is the Buddha's teachings from the suttas. And that really has um, been pretty amazing, especially where we relocated in Mountain View, which we were like a mile from Google headquarters, and we ran into a lot of people who are pretty stressed. <laughs> and they would find out that they're, they'd be um, on Google looking for uh, uh, the Buddhist teachings, you know, like uh, typing in monastery or monks or something. I don't know what they would Google, but they would find us like around the corner from where they're living and come over for Wednesday night sutta study. And it was really lovely to see people go from super stressed to, you know, taking the precepts and listening to the Buddha's teachings and, you know, less stressed and more happy as the weeks went on. And that's been, that's been um, wonderful and it's been inspiring. It's been inspiring to see how we can offer the Dhamma directly from the suttas and make it applicable to people's lives. That what the Buddha taught was so practical and also so complete. So I want to um, put in a plug for the Buddha. <laughs> That may seem totally unnecessary in this context, <laughs> but um, I, I really felt like I wanted to know for sure what the Buddha himself said. And it's wonderful digging into the discourses in the Pali Canon because it's so reliable, consistent, um, and complete in terms of you know addressing everything in our life really and um, and it's wonderful to see the scholarship that's come along um, i'm not a scholar i don't expect to become a scholar in this lifetime um, i'm i'm more like okay i've i've read the whole um all of the early suttas and that's, you know, like the four major Nikayas and many parts of the fifth Nikaya. And if you want to know what that means, you, you can ask and then we'll explain. But 
it's amazing how much we have from the Buddha himself and how the scholars like, you know, Bhikkhu Bodhi and Bhante Analyo and Bhante Sujato and um, Ajahn Brahmali and, you know, and Aya Dhammadina, you know, they, they really are taking a deep look at these texts and comparing them with uh, similarly ancient texts that went in a different direction. You know, so the Pali, what turns out to what, what became the Pali suttas went south from where the Buddha had been. And the Chinese Agamas went east. And, you know, 2,500 years later, scholars look at them and find that they're very tightly correlated or matching. And so it gives a great deal of confidence for the meticulous effort of so many people to pass these teachings down intact which is really wonderful. The other sort of thing that gives a lot of confidence in these teachings is the way in which they are consistent internally. And the more you read them, and it takes some, it takes some effort or some persistence to learn how to read them in a way that is, um, you know, natural and you can feel like you really really getting the feeling of what the Buddha was saying and, and what he was teaching. But to, to read them um, in their entirety like that really gives you a full picture of the Dhamma and how to apply it. And uh, not only that, but a picture of who the Buddha was and how he interacted with people. So there are many, many stories as part of the, the Pali suttas that show, you know, people coming to the Buddha, asking questions, or coming to the Buddha and challenging him, or, you know, uh, ways in which monastics lived and things that they experienced and the way that the Buddha taught, and, and how um, compassionate and caring and wise he was, and the way he would get people on board by, instead of, you know, saying, well, this is, this is the way it is, it's, he'd ask them a question, or he'd say, you know, well, that's not the way we think about it in this tradition, or in this what he that it's a, the noble one's discipline. That's not how we we think of it. And then the person can ask, well, how do you think of it, or how do you see it? And then the Buddha has this permission, really the buy-in. He's always like finding ways to get people interested in buying into what it is. He doesn't just like you know, give people a piece of his mind. <laughs> and, and we're not allowed to either, you know, this request of the Dhammas, we're not, we're not supposed to just walk up to someone and tell them about our, um, our great teacher and our teachings. It's, it's really there for people to inquire about, which means they've already signed up. It's a very important part of it. But it's really beautiful to look at how the Buddha did that. You know, even with people who came and were super angry with him. Um, there are, there's a series of suttas. I haven't looked at it recently, so I'm not sure quite how accurate I'll be probably close. There's a series of suttas where one of the members of a, of a big clan comes uh, to the Buddha and he becomes inspired and he ordains and then another actually i guess he starts out angry too if i remember <laughs> he's got some bone to pick with the buddha about what he's doing and the buddha um, explains to him and convinces him uh, and and shows him uh, the dhamma and and he is really inspired by that and he decides to ordain so he becomes a monk and then another relative hears about this and he's really angry that his relative when he became a monk so he comes and he's blasting the buddha and this one you might have heard of i don't know but the buddha says after you know the buddha's just sitting there and he's this guy is just really hauling off on him and and the and the buddha says so do you ever have guests over at your house i mean this is not what this guy was expecting to hear right? <laughs> calmly do you ever have visitors and he's like well yes 
do you do you um, you know give them food? Oh no, do they bring you gifts? Is that how it goes? Yeah, do they bring you gifts? Well, what if you don't accept their gifts? Who who do they belong to? He said they're theirs. He said, I don't accept your gift of this berating. It belongs to you. And first, the guy is really upset. He thinks the Buddha is cursing him. But then he's he as the Buddha as he talks to the Buddha and the Buddha, you know, continues to work with him he starts to really see where the Buddha is coming from and he gets inspired and then he ordains. And then there's a third one that comes angry. Anyhow, you get the idea. And it's really quite lovely to see these, um, these stories repeated that have come down from, you know, so long ago. And how many of you read the suttas in the, yeah, some of you, and how many of you know about like the what the Nikayas are? Some of you may may not. I didn't at first. I only had heard about the Dhammapada before I went to Thailand and was spending time um, at the International Monastery of Ajahn Chah with my son and the other monks. And and then um, one of the friends of my son gave me a, a copy of the Middle Length Discourses, and it was like gold. Um, it's it's one of um, there's four different major volumes of Nikaya of, of uh, suttas and this one has all of, all kinds of uh, different different ways of describing the Dhamma uh, involving different people kings and nobles and people with you know, slaves and people of all different different walks of life and coming to the Buddha with different questions and problems. You know, the young woman who's recently married and actually her husband, I think, is the one who says we're having so much trouble with her. She's so angry and, and, um, and the Buddha talks to her about being married. And he said, you know, there are different ways that you can be in this relationship. You get to choose how you're going to be with it and so she says you know the buddha says you can you can be like a a friend to this person you can be like a servant to this person you can be like a mother to this person you can you know these are, and he talked about these different you know ways you can be you can be like a slave and he said and she said well count me as the slave I mean, she's living in ancient India where you get like, this is arranged and she doesn't like it at all. And it's, it's like, you know, but he can, but she can still hear the Dhamma and I don't remember what happens to her, do you? I think that, that was kind of like, wow, that's how it is for women sometimes in ancient India. How about here? The Buddha gave women ordination and he even said you know come bhikkhuni just like he did with men come and he even made a rule that you know there's a rule that um, you're not a, you're not to uh, you're not to ordain anyone younger than 20 years old but he said if a girl is married you can ordain her as early as 12 years old. So he's giving this opportunity for women to be able, girls to be able to free, become free from that situation. They did need permission. And oftentimes when the Buddha, um, husbands would give their permission. And then the husbands would get inspired. And um, in one case, he decided to become a monk, and he freed everybody, <laughs> all, of, all of the people in his in his uh, household. Um, he he gave them all different kinds of ways to sustain themselves before he left. So there are these these stories, these opportunities for us to look at. You know, how does this apply to our life? And some of them, of course, are much more um, easily 
translate it into what we can use. Um, you know, the ways in which the Buddha talked about friendship, for example. You know, like the importance of, you know, noticing if the friends we are with are really um, sincere or not. They're really morally grounded or not. And, you know, the, um, the ways in which we can train the mind. Um, he talked about, you know, the, the doctrine, which can be really kind of very formal, but he also talked about application that can really give us the chance to shape our practice. The Buddha gave so many different methods for meditation and for living life that we can really look there to find what really is suitable for us at the time. So when we teach, um, we try to, well, we listen to people. And we do quite a lot of counseling, you could say. And then we often, uh, we do invite people to tell us about the things they're interested in hearing about. And so we um, will, you know, really dig out the teachings, the things that happened at the time of the Buddha that would apply. And people find that helpful. I mean, it's, it's like you can look at the issues that we may have, whether it's something with health or with a loss of, of livelihood or with, you know, just any situation you can think of. And there'll be something there that's supportive in the suttas. For myself, I really wanted to know what the Buddha said because we hear so many things attributed to the Buddha that really aren't from the Buddha. And I don't know if you've seen this website called Fake Buddha Quotes, but it's very helpful. Yeah, it is funny too. <laughs> and, you know, to, to look at not just, it's, I, I like the way that uh, he does that. Do you know his name? I've forgotten what it is, but he, he really, he investigates what, where the quote might be re related and how it got kind of altered or changed. And this is uh, worth examining because the Buddha was careful in the way he talked about things. He never oversteps what he knows. So there's like this series of suttas where he talks about no discoverable beginning. And, you know, he doesn't say there's no beginning, but there's no discoverable beginning. In all of the eons that he could see passed into his past lives and, and how the world you know, ex the universes, the universes expand and contract and expand and contract. So he was all over the Big Bang Theory before any of the scientists ever got there. But it's like he, he couldn't see a beginning. So the thing that I like is he doesn't then assume there's no beginning. Oh, if I can't see it, it doesn't exist. He just says there's no discoverable beginning. And this is a good thing for us to notice in the way that we speak and in the way that, in the way that we think, too, you know, so that when we are, um, when, when we know something, know where the limits of that knowledge are and, and really say what we know and not go farther than that. So like someone was talking to us recently about, saying that something that happened to them, you know, like they were born in this particular family, and she said, that was my karma. And the person listening is kind of like, you know, I don't really buy that. What does that mean? And, and the suggestion we had was, what if you just said there were causes and conditions for this? It's very different than just like assuming you know this is the way karma worked in your history. And just things like that. I don't know. Is this making any sense? OK. 
okay. It's it's like it, the the care we take with being truthful, being accurate with what we know and what we share really makes a difference in how reliable we are and how much people can trust what we say. So it, when we see the Buddha, I think it's amazing to notice, you know, how he goes about things, how he talks to people. Do you have any suttas you think would be good to weave in here? Oh, and Guttura 9-5, the powers. So how many people were here this morning? <coughs> Heard this story already? Two or three? Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, this sutta was kind of a sleeper. I just um, ran across it teaching them about the Anguttara Nikaya, and I talk about it a lot because it's helpful for facing what we fear. So this, the sutta is entitled Powers, and it's about four powers and five fears. So the five fears um, you may be familiar with in your own life. I mean, have you ever been afraid of losing your livelihood? Or maybe becoming um, blamed by someone or getting a bad reputation or um, feeling uh, uneasy in a, in a group, in an assembly of people, like maybe timid or worried or being afraid of dying or being afraid of what might happen after you die. So the Buddha said that if you develop four powers, you never have to worry about those things those fears can go away. <coughs> so usually when I get to this point, I say, do you want to know what they are? <laughs> so that's, that's, that's a humorous kind of like tri sort of approach of the Buddha, right? It's like, do you want to hear? <laughs> so the first one that the Buddha talks about is the power of wisdom. And wisdom is defined in different ways in the suttas. And in this case, he's talking about the wisdom of knowing what is wholesome and what is unwholesome. And for the Buddha, that's not a like a um, judgment of like what's okay, what's not okay. It's really about what brings more peace, more happiness, or what brings more suffering. And so he's always looking at results, not just an idea, not some, he didn't make up a philosophy. The Buddha reported on his own experience. And so he talks about, well, we pretty much naturally know what's um, wholesome and unwholesome, blamable and blameless leading to good results and leading to painful results. And so the, that wisdom is the wisdom he's talking about. And then he talks about energy. The, the next power is the power of energy. And the, the power of energy is the energy to really do what's gonna lead to good results, do what's wholesome and to avoid the unwholesome. And the third one is the power of blamelessness. So when we are living according to precepts and you know everybody does some things that aren't perfect, of course, but in general, we're, when we're living a wholesome, wholesome ways, then we're blameless. Even if someone blames us for something, it's not true. So it's not something we need to worry about. 
And the fourth power, which was really a surprise to me when I read this, is the power of sustaining favorable relationships. And when you, when you, it, so what does that mean? You know, how do you do that? And the Buddha actually laid it out clearly in, a, in, a, in that sutta and in a, a couple of other suttas. That the way to sustain relationships with people, and he said favorable ones, you know, relationships with people that we trust and admire, relationships with people who are also uh, have this intention to uh, be wholesome and do good things. And they may have, uh, they may excel in some particular way with their virtue or their generosity. But whatever it is that we know this is a this is a good relationship to sustain, to develop, then the Buddha says there are four ways that you can do that. And noticing if some kind of um, gift would be beneficial to this person, then give them that gift. If you notice that some kind of encouraging words would be beneficial to them, encourage them with your words. If there's something you can do to help them that would be supportive, then do that. Be munificent, bene beneficial to them in that way. And then also treat people with a kind of impartiality that, you know, like, one way to think of that is by being even in our temperament and with them, you know, not, not, um, you know, nice to them one time and kind of off uh, moody, you know, in another time, but to be kind and generous with them all the time to, and to also treat people in general with impartiality. So this addresses any kind of, um, discrimination against people and it addresses you know like if you're uh, teaching a group of people or if you're you know uh, working with people to treat them equally treat them with impartiality it brings a kind of confidence and um, trust so when you look at those four powers and you see those five fears, you can get the sense that you don't have to have so much concern about, say, losing your livelihood. Um, and usually when I talk about this, I refer back to the way I grew up on the farm in a small uh, town of mostly farming people and, and local merchants. And uh, people helped each other. They knew each other. They took care of each other in these ways of sustaining these relationships. And they helped each other. So one farmer got sick. and My dad planted the rest of his corn that year. And my dad got in an accident. And the other farmers came in and finished the harvest. And there were when my father died, my father always said, you know, when I, when I, when I die, you know, like, five people are going to show up. Like, no no one's going to pay any attention. But actually, when he died, um, people were lined up out the funeral home and around the block to talk to my mom and to view the body. And people drove over from four states away. <laughs> and it was because, and every person that came through had a story of something he had done for them. But he left sweet corn on my porch. He plowed out my driveway with his, with his tractor, you know, it's like constant. My mom turned to me and she said, I didn't know he did that, you know, different things. And it was just really heartwarming. And, you know, this is, this is um, sustaining relationships. When you really build a community and you are connected to each other, you don't have to be so afraid about these things that can happen to any of us. Right? So, you can see that, you know, losing your livelihood, and you have a safety net to get you over the rough spots. Um, there was a, a woman in Portland who got COVID, and her, uh, the people she lived with wanted her to immediately move out. Not so great, huh? 
And in her spiritual community, the leader of the community had um, had a um, like a recreational vehicle parked on their property, and she said, "You come stay here." And people from the community came, fed her, took care of her. It's beautiful. And this is what we can do with each other, especially in a community like this. And I hope we talk about this more later today. So sustaining favorable relationships can help with that. And of course, if we're really following these, developing these powers, you know, if you like, you can think of them as superpowers, you know, <laughs> wisdom, you know, um, blamelessness, energy, that kind of energy. It's, it's, of course, we don't have to worry about losing, getting a bad reputation. Even if someone accuses us, like I said, it, it, does, it goes nowhere. People accuse the Buddha, so it's not like we're going to go through life without being blamed for things. But it's, it's, um, it's, not, it's not something we have to fear. And when, wherever we are, whatever group we're in, we can hold our head up. We can, we can show up with confidence. Of course, then there's death and what comes after death. And that requires a certain development of understanding of cause and effect to really feel confident in that. And of course, sometimes, even though we, you know, try our best to do all these things, we still have fears. We still have anxiety. We still worry about things. And at that stage, when we're doing, you know, what we can, and also we have to be a little bit careful if you're kind of lean toward the perfectionist side of things, to, have, to develop a lot of kindness and generosity for ourselves and for others. We all do things that are not the best to acknowledge that and, and learn from it and let it go. And, and when we're when we're still feeling less than, anxious, worried about things, even though we're doing, you know, all of these good things to, the, to our, you know, what's possible at that point, at this point in our life, then I think really looking at developing more kindness and compassion, especially for ourselves, and noticing What's underneath those feelings? Can I see those feelings as impermanent, as not really belonging to me, as just being a conditioned phenomenon? So that we can see them outside of, you know, me as an object, as something we can observe, and that we can really understand them in context so that they're not automatically perpetuated. And this is how we can work with um, whatever arises in our life. It comes right back to the basics of the Four Noble Truths. So when the Buddha talked about dukkha as the thing to really notice when it's there, it's because that's the, right, the, the flashing light that says, OK, there's something for me to take care of here something to bring more awareness to, something to bring more kindness to, more generosity. And when we do that, and we look at, you know, what is this based on? Where does it come from? It's not enough to just say, oh, I'm attached to something. It's too glib. It doesn't really do the job, I don't think, usually. But it's, it's more. It's, it's more directly nuanced and, con and contextual than that. When we're able to unpack that somewhat, bring it, bring it into the open, then we can start to understand what it is that we can do for ourselves, you know, being that, sustaining that favorable relationship with ourselves. What does my heart need? What does my mind need? in order to really let go, feel that relief, 
um, feel that confidence. Trust, trust in our wisdom, trust in our virtue, trust in our efforts and trust in each other. I think I'll close it there. Thank you, Ari. We have about, maybe we could do about 10, 10 or 10 minutes of questions, and then we'll share a meal. And then after the meal, there'll be opportunity for a bit more Q&A with each other as well. Um, maybe 10 to 15 minutes, maybe, questions, something like that. Yeah, yeah, so 15 minutes of questions right now. And then afterwards, there'll be a bit more time. And um, if you want to ask a question, I think it'd be a little too much to run the mic around, but to speak up, uh, maybe say your name as well. And then you could repeat the question for the, oh, actually, let's go here. So, any, question, any questions? Yeah, do you want to send the mic? Okay, we'll just repeat it. Yeah, I think the question to just kind of pare it down, let me know if I get it enough. You know, we want to be kind and generous, and sometimes we're not. Sometimes we get really irritated. And what do we do about that when we feel irritable, especially with someone we care about uh, very deeply, maybe? And I can say that I definitely experienced this a lot with my mother. And um, I, would, I would get impatient with her and say things that I didn't really want to say. And I'd walk away feeling you know, bad about myself. I could, how could I be like this with my mom? But it was a challenging relationship. And what I, what I notice about irritation is there's something to ask ourselves, what is it that I want to have be different than it is? There's something happening here that I don't want to be this way. And with my mom, she was starting to get dementia. I really wanted her to be my mom, like a, the normal mom. She was so supportive, right? I didn't want her to be losing it. And I had to face that. I had to recognized that I needed to develop more patience and accept where she was. And I may be different for you, but to look at what is it, there's something here. If I'm unhappy, if I'm irritable, if, if I'm experiencing dukkha, there's something happening that I don't want to have be this way. What is it? And when we can acknowledge what it is, we can identify what it is. How do I want it to be? And then I can accept it's not, but that's not how it is. This is how it is. 
So if you've listened to Ajahn Sumedho, his voice rings in my head when it's like, this is the way it is. <laughs> it's not this other way. And also, you know, that I might discover, and I have many times, that there is something in myself that I'm, I'm not being the way I want to be. And I have to like first go, okay, this is, this is the way I'm being. This is what is happening. I get triggered. So sometimes, um, especially toward the end of her life, I stayed with her when she was going through the dying process. And still, I could anticipate when this happens, this is what she's going to say, and this is the horrible feeling that's going to come up in me, and this is how I'm going to handle it. And that helped a lot, you know, to just be ready. <laughs> because in those relationships that were so close, those things happen over and over again. And, you know, it's a great training ground for us to change our pattern in these situations because this is what helps us change our pattern in the way we think and the way we practice. You know, we're not going to be the way we are right now once we're enlightened. If we're going to get enlightened, we're going to have to change. And some of the things that we have to change are really fundamental. You know, like just the way we perceive things. And so this is a great training ground. And it's also important not to be too hard on yourself as you're making this shift. Just look for the, the improvement and in, encourage yourself with that. <clears throat> like if you go through one of those episodes where the thing gets said that would cause you to react in a certain way, and then you don't, you go, wow, that was great, I did it. I, <laughs> I got through that whole visit without doing that. <laughs> thing. Yeah. Thank you. Other questions for anyone here? Yes. Yes. <laughs> and that's when I was right. Oh. <laughs> so, um, how to just write a cartoon on the side of it, and it's going to look so wonderful. Yeah, these are good questions. How to maintain kindness, how to uh, know when to take action and when not to. These are very good questions. Um, the, the example given uh, is the airplanes going overhead and, you know, just calmly meditating and wishing them well and may they arrive safely and then 30 seconds, oh, 15 seconds later, the next plane goes over, and it's like, I wish you well. <laughs> and another 10 seconds later, the next plane, it's like, <clears throat> close enough. <laughs> How do you maintain the patience, the... Um, the generosity. And I think the first thing, the, the thing we have to do is as soon as we catch the shift in our, in our mood, in our perception, in our feeling, to acknowledge it. And, and I like, I use this kind of um, gesture of like putting my hand out in front and you hold it out here in front of you. It's like, oh, there's irritation. Come here, irritation. <laughs> Where I can look at you and, 
and bring some kindness to that reality that I, I have these limits and it's okay or right now you know, this is this is like some sometime we might be able to sit through 15 planes going overhead and it's nothing, but maybe today it's not like that and that's okay. But then when we recognize the irritation is there or whatever, whatever flavor of feeling it is, you recognize that it's there. And then you're seeing it not as me or mine, but as a phenomenon that's occurring and then we can really bring mindfulness to it asking questions about it where does that arise in my body you know um, what else do I remember about this feeling um, in my history those kinds of things and you know when to take action and when not to take action is a really good question. When we say action, it's like, you know, when I think we can think of it on a couple levels. When do I really make this an object of my attention? And when do I just kind of like try to let it go? So you can try to let it go first. First you acknowledge, okay, I'm starting to get irritated by the noise or whatever and then noticing it and bringing yourself back. Maybe that's enough. You know, it's, it's kind of like the sutta where the Buddha talks about the removal of distracting thoughts. He gives like five methods. He says, well, and then if that doesn't work, then you do this. And if that doesn't work, then you do this. And it's along these lines of, oh, you know, first you try to replace what you're thinking with something wholesome, and then you try to ignore it and then you try to look deeper at the basis of it, what's behind it, and so on. So it's a little like that. You can try to not do anything at first and see if it just if that's if that's enough. But then when we really are dealing, when we're really grappling with things that are deeply painful or recurring then this method of really examining it, this is really the first three noble truths, the method of noticing the dukkha and examining what that's about. And there are various ways of doing it. And, and you can actually um, get to the cessation of that dukkha just through that investigation. But most, mo the most effective way I've found is by really locating the feeling that's associated with it in the body and observing it there. Now the other level of when do you do things and when do you not do things I think is more on the, the external action. Like how much do we simply endure? When do you endure and when do you say something or do something? to change the situation. And it's a lot, a lot of it has to do with how much good can I do by taking action externally? You know, is it really possible to help the situation? And at the same time, I need to take action internally so that I can come to peace with whatever it is, not, not be attached or expecting some kind of outcome of whatever action I take. And then, you know, when we, when we take whatever action we can take, and it doesn't go the direction we want to, the Buddha says at that point, you say, the karma is really strong, now what can I do? So you accept it. You can't change it, you accept it. And then you see what it is you can do. Because really, if you think about it, there's always something we can do. I remember Ajahn Prasanna one time saying, there's always something that you can do to be generous. Generosity, because 
you can be generous even in your thoughts. So if you think about that, there's always an opportunity to do something. And then that's what you do. Does anyone have any questions for them? We get you both so rarely. <laughs> yeah. I think we have time for one more. Let's see. Any more questions? Anyone? Yes. My name's Jason. Hi, Jason. I find that. that there's a, an identification with and having to sustain that role and be working in that role, whether that's setting boundaries and having that kind of role. It's very painful. It's a source of evil, you know, especially raising a lot of really false starts early on. Yeah. Really difficult. Um, but I was hoping maybe you could speak a little about Holding, holding those responsibilities in that role is inviting. Yeah. Yeah, so the question is about the roles that we play, whether it's parenting or maybe a work role. You know, if you're, if you're the manager, you know, how do you hold that in a way that has compassion and maybe um, more lightly? So something you see in the monastery, you'll have someone, <clears throat> you know, they enter the robes and they're part of the community and they're really great community member. And then, you know, they get a little more seniority and a little more seniority and then they become the work monastic and suddenly they're a holy terror. Because <laughs> now they have this responsibility, this role, and they're trying to do it. And maybe they don't have much training in how to, how to do that, right? And can be rough on everyone. <laughs> and you know, this is this is um, an opportunity to look at you know who do we think we are, and how do we separate our sense of identity from the role, and see how we can fulfill the role that we've taken responsibility for. Um, without um, without being so identified with it that we can't see when to make changes, for example, something like that. Because if we're if we're too identified with the role, then and we're taking things personally, we get all wrapped up in it. But if we can see that, this role, like everything else, uh, that I think is me or mine, is actually not. It's just a process. <clears throat> and hopefully, I can use this role, this identification, uh, you know, identifying like what a certain role is, like you know, being the the work nun or the abbess or the co abbess or the whatever, you know, um, trying to avoid believing what other people think of you in that role, um, taking in their, their feedback and making use of it. And I don't mean like dismissing everything, but to not, um, to not let that be defining you. So what I mean by that is, um, like, for example, you know, when spiritual teachers um, start identifying with the gratification that students might give them, they're in trouble. 
And even as a parent, you know, being the mom, there are certain, some things that I'm absolutely responsible for. So I have two kids. But if I, if I get into trying to be the perfect mom, um, it, does, it doesn't do anybody any good. If I can just see it more as, okay, how can I, how can I support them? How can I um, be kind to myself and to them and to recognize that this is, this is an unfolding process? a job that's so complicated, I'm never going to be able to make the right decision every time. It's appreciating the complexity of any of these roles. The work monk, it's a complicated job. You're not going to make the right decision or say the right thing every time. If we can bring that kind of humility to the whole thing, um, you know, I think when the kids are old enough and you can share with them the you know without without making them feel unsafe or, <laughs> or um, worried at all but to share with them the the process of making certain decisions you know to help them understand that it's not like any of us ever um, are flawless or um, there's not just one wonderfully neat, pat, right answer. So I think humility and when I talked about loving the suttas and a lot of it is, you know, as a teacher of Dhamma, I don't have to, it's not my wisdom. It's the Buddha's wisdom that I rely on. You know, it's like we can, we can look at the principles of Dhamma as our basis, whether we're parenting or managing or whatever we're doing. Um, and, and that's the ground that gives the confidence to know how to address things. And so... That's what I would say, you know, look to a deeper source. The Dhamma is there available to everybody, and in, regardless of religious tradition, actually. So it's like, you know, if, if we can ground our decisions in that and monitor our ego um, involvement in whatever it is so that we can, you know, step, step outside of that. Thank you.